Hello, today is Thursday, October 8th, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing tonight? Um, tonight is a 7 o'clock interview, so we're coming at you at night. Um, it's kind of a chilly night out there, but hey, it's not raining, or that big bad word that starts with an S-N-O-W. <laughs> um... I want to welcome you to the show, and we have a great show in store for you. We are very fortunate to have Bigfoot expert Troy Hudson with us today, and I have a feeling that it's going to be an absolutely fascinating interview. Um, first, we're going to take a little glimpse into the missing persons files. We haven't done this in a while. Um, lately, I've been kind of dedicating shows to um, special people that I know that are struggling in their lives with the horrible disease cancer. And, um, you know, I like to, uh, when I, when I find out that somebody's struggling or even if there's something good going on in their fight, I like to share that with you guys. So, um, please keep the prayers coming in as they're very well needed and very appreciated. Um, our first missing person is a Utah woman, Emily Amanda Quijano, Q-U-I-J-A-N-O, Elmira Inn. Um, a 23-year-old female has been missing from Orem, Utah, since September 11, 2015. Emily is five foot six, weighs 105 pounds, has brown hair and brown eyes. If you know where Emily is or have any information, you are asked to call the Orem Police Department at 801-229-7070 or Private Investigator Jason K. Jensen at 801-759-2248. Four, eight. And again, you can go right on Info to Rail Google Sites, my webpage, and you can check out a picture of her so that you have an idea of what she looks like and what you can look out for. Um, the second one is about a newborn, and this one really touched me. Um, so I wanted to share this one. There was a newborn found outside Southern Indiana Church. It has an infection. Um, the mother's life may be at risk. At approximately 5.15 p.m. on September 24, 2015, a newborn baby boy delivered, or believed to be Caucasian, was located abandoned at Christ's Way Christian Church at 2425 North State Highway 3 in North Vernon, Indiana. Um, the pastor's wife located the child outside the church on the ground near the trash, cleaned up and wrapped in several coats. Investigators say that the child has developed an infection and is being treated for that issue. Police say the child's mother could have the same infection, which would be life-threatening if not treated soon, and it's imperative that the mother of the child come forward given new information about the infection the child is facing. Um, anyone with any information, please contact the North Vernon Police Department at 812-346-1466 or Central Dispatch at 812-346-2345. Um, like I tell you guys every time I do these, it is so important to me, and I have such a passion, you know, to find these missing people and at least bring closure to their family, if not bring them home safely. You know, I can't even imagine being in the shoes of somebody who has a missing person in their life that they love. It's got to be the biggest devastation and the biggest hole in their heart, you know, just to, to not know if their child or their loved one is okay or what has happened to them. So please, let's come together as a community, guys, as a world. Let's come together and look for these people. We're going to take a short break now, and when we return, we will have Troy Hudson with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back with Troy Hudson. Troy had his first experiences, first experience with what people call Bigfoot when he was nine years old in southern Oklahoma. Later in life, he attended a Bigfoot expedition with the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization in 2005 and subsequently became an investigator and later on an organizer for the BFRO field expeditions in Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. Hello, Troy, and welcome to Info to Rail, and thank you so much for being on our show. Well, thank you for having me. This is something that I've wanted to get into the topic of for so long because it's something that I'm very, very interested in, and that is the topic of Bigfoot. Um, can you tell us about 
how you got started in this? Um, well, I got actually started into it in the latter part of 2004. Um, at my job, I was in law enforcement, and I was sitting in my office, and another coworker came in and asked me if I – he knew I was from Oklahoma. I was, I was working at the Dallas uh, field office. And he asked me, so you're from Oklahoma? I said, yes. He said, you ever seen a Bigfoot? I said, well, <laughs> I had an encounter when I was younger. And I said, heard stories as I was growing up. You know, it's something in a lot of the Oklahoma folklore, especially if you're connected to Native native, uh, you know, customs and traditions. And he showed me a website. At that time, it was a BFRO, Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. And they were having a field expedition in Honabi, Oklahoma. And I know that place very well. I grew up not too far from there, spent a little bit of time there as a child, and I called them, went on the expedition, found out I knew a little bit more about the topic than what I thought. And actually, it was really easy, and the uh, curator, uh, Matt, at the time asked me, since I had a law enforcement background, and he needed somebody to do field investigations in the Oklahoma, Texas area. So that's how I joined in, and then I started leading the expeditions in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. That is pretty awesome. It's been it's something I've been very interested in for a lot of years. Um, but you're my first guest that I've had on about Bigfoot, so this okay. is a, this is so exciting. <laughs> I was looking through because um, a lot of people, you know, I listen to Coast to Coast a lot. Uh, George Norrie is one of the reasons why I do what I do. Um, you know, it's it's something I always wanted to do, and he gave me the inspiration to, you know, do this internet radio thing, and I love it. But that's, you know, I listened to him, and, and I came across yours, and I was so excited. I said, I just got to try to get him on my show. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. Any, whatever, whatever I can do. Um, can you tell us um, what you have, have you ever actually experienced in your lifetime have you ever seen a Bigfoot? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I have. Can you tell us about that encounter? Uh, just one. Tell us as much as you want. We love it. <laughs> uh, well, um, it, it's a little hard for some people to believe, but actually to to um, hold my story and what I'm about to say is true is I have multiple witnesses and, you know, like I said, I've been doing this part of the field work since about the latter part of 2004. And I'm kind of a person, I'm an outdoor person. So I, if I'm going to do investigations, I'm going to take reports, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go in the field. Um, I try to spend a little time on the computer because you're not going to learn anything unless you go out and get in the field. Well, my encounter as a child uh, at a Boy Scout camp is actually where – I would think to say that that was my first one, but of course it was a silhouette. And it, and over the years, what I've seen now has led to the evidence to believe that that's what I saw when I was younger. But since then, I've had the opportunity and been very, very lucky to have some long-term investigations. That's what some people refer to as habituation sites. And there was one in North Texas that I was working for four years. And luckily... By the grace of the Lord, I was only less than 30 miles from this location. So I was able to go over there very frequently. And you can imagine in four years, spending just about almost every other weekend at the location, something is going to happen, and it did. I've, I've um, observed quite a bit. I learned a lot uh, working that site. Another gentleman that was actually helping me and kind of cootering me in those days was another BFRO investigator that's actually working the um, Adrian Erickson project in Kentucky. Dennis Ho, we worked the Kentucky project, and he would fly to Texas and help me. And there was a lot that went on. I gained a lot of knowledge in those four years. And, I, I mean, I don't even know where to start to tell you that because spending time, if you learn to be patient, be respectful, you may see some things, and I actually got a chance. Like I said, you're spending more time you spend in the field, the more chances you have seeing something. And that's exactly what I did. Like anything, you know, the more years you drive a vehicle, 
your greater chance of being in an accident of being in a vehicle. So it's the same thing as anything. The more you spend time in it, the more experience you're going to get, and most likely you're going to get to see something. And I was in the beginning to wear a start of <laughs> which uh, which um, observation do you even tell you? Because I classificate classification as I've had day sightings and I've had night sightings. So. Well, we're open to listen to anything you want to talk about. I mean, this is something that my listeners are really interested in. And like I said, up till now, we haven't had the opportunity to have somebody on here to talk with us about it. So, Well, um, I mean, one thing I can probably describe is that it's not what a lot of people think. And unfortunately, TV and Internet uh, tanks people with what they're expected to see because you know, I, I ran a lot of the Bigfoot or big, big BFRO expeditions in Oklahoma and Texas and Arkansas through 2006 to right about 2009. And then we started, I left BFRO and we started doing our own little private with our own little group, you know, just friends. It wasn't until about four years ago we just started, we're going to start doing expeditions and invite people because people are asking. It ended up being just word of mouth, but the more the I'm trying to say is, with the people that come out on expeditions, I try to explain to them in the beginning that, you know, a lot of them are enthusiastic about it and also they're Bigfoot enthusiasts. So they do the research. They watch the TV shows. They do the movies. They read the books. They do the Internet. And then I explain to them that when they come out on the expedition, it's not quite that way. You're expecting to see something in your mind and a little bit of psychology there. You're seeing something on the TV. You're watching a movie, you're reading the book, you're reading blogs, you're reading websites. It's not quite that way. So, in other words, having to take someone and retrain them of what it's really like to be out in the field, because basically it's not just going out and searching for clues and looking around. You have to pay attention. There's a great attention to detail. If you find a spot, you're sitting in that spot, and you... Observe everything about the environment around you. Like over just last weekend, taking someone that has spent a lot of time in the field, they're a hunter, they've got field experience, uh, you know, being out in the outdoors, they camp. But actually teaching them to sit down and actually, okay, examine that little area of the woods. What does not fit? Well, tree branches, trees are normally vertical. You have rocks that are around, you have bushes. You're looking for something that does not fit. What doesn't fit is a head and shoulder or an arm sticking out from behind a tree. That's what you teach people to look for. Because people think they're looking for a big, hairy, you know, giant walking through the woods. Well, they're elusive. They're not just away from you. What just went? Um, I got to figure out what just happened here with my sound. I just lost it all. making some crazy noises. And my tech guy's trying to figure out why my sound just went. I don't know if it's through my phone. Shouldn't be. But this has never happened to me before. This is crazy. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Now you're absolutely fine. I don't know what just happened there, but that has never happened to me before. All of a sudden, everything just kind of went away on me. That is creepy. When did it go away? What? what? It's never Do you remember where I was talking? It's never happened to me. That is, like, so <laughs> creepy. Well, unfortunately, that's my life. I'm, I have a lot of weird things happen. <laughs> um, yeah, you were talking about um, that to retrain someone to, you know, to notice the things in the woods that are different, that are, they don't right. belong. Yeah. Right. Well, just let me know wherever you want me to start over or, or oh. where you want me to pick back up. Or You can go right ahead from there. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, what it... What it is is what I learned actually because of my military background and some of the training, some of the schools I went to, 
some of the schools in a law enforcement side, you know, be basically teaching you surveillance, how to watch somebody, how to watch somebody when they don't think you're watching them. Some of those techniques are still employed in some of our expeditions because one of the things that's is difficult to explain, but the people who go on the expedition they kinda of understand how it works. Normally the Bigfoot are gonna to try to stay away from you. That's the whole point. They're they're they wanna live in their own world and they're trying to stay uh, you know, disconnected from, from us, but what I've learned over the years though, if you provide a more relaxed, more respectful environment, sometimes they come over to see what you're doing. You're not going into the woods to look for them. You put yourself in a spot of I guess vulnerability is a is a is a term that some people have used. You put yourself in the open spot. Let them have the playground. Let them have the woods to hide in. And sometimes it it works out that some people do get to see them peeking around a tree or crossing the the trail or actually crossing one of the roads that sometimes we sit on. So it does happen. Not every single person gets to see one, but if you look at our past um, history with everybody going out on an expedition, it's usually about seven out of ten people actually get to see something. So, I, you know, I think one of my favorite movies in the whole wide world was Harry and the Hendersons, and I just thought that right. that was just an amazing movie. And ever since I've I watched that movie, it's just to me that's so interesting. I think that that would just be one of the most fascinating things in the world to actually be able to witness seeing an actual Bigfoot. Well, if you remember at the end of the movie, when he walks into the woods and all the other ones kind of come out from the bushes from around the side of the trees, do you remember that part? Yes, I do. That is almost identical to how it kind of happens. If 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 I if I put you in a spot and said, okay, this is normally where they come up from the from the side of the ridge, this is the area where they usually walk, you know, walk up the, the side of the hill, if you were to pay attention to that area and just concentrate on that area, that's how that happens. You know, they're not just walking out in the open. You know, sometimes they're they're a little shy and, you know, but sometimes they do expose themselves. And that's where the attention to detail has to come in because, you know, everybody goes out there and like, oh, well, I've, been, I've been here for an hour and I haven't seen nothing. Well, <laughs> the also thing that learns is a little bit of patience. Because remember, you're on their time. You're, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people try to push the issue and try to push aside and try to try to go out there and try to elicit them to try to come near. But you have to kind of be on their time. So. Well, it's, it's kind of like hunting in the woods. I mean, you can't tell a deer when to come around. Right. Yeah. I, I, it's that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And it is one of the things. It also happens that you do not read about and you don't hear about and you don't see on the TV shows is we like to explain to people that there's a little disclaimer in the beginning of it because some people, not everybody, but there's a few that happens every now and then. Sometimes they do not have the encounter they thought they were going to get. Some people, I like to think there's three different types of people. You have the, the witness that goes out and says, wow, I, I'm, I'm hooked. New, it's a new, it's a new thing. I'm hooked. I'm doing everything Bigfoot. Well, they get excited, and that's. Then you have the other person that basically is kind of trying to figure out what they just saw. They're trying to figure it out because they've been told the entire life they don't exist. It's all hoax. It's all rumor. People are just seeing things. Well, you just saw it with your own eyes, walking upright and cross over trail, going to the woods. Well, that plays on your mind. Because, again, you're told it does not exist. So they have a little bit of trouble with it. You know, they're trying to wrap their mind around what they just saw. And then the third person, it really tears them apart because they just, there's something about their mind to where it sets in their beliefs. And it really freaks them out of what they just saw because we had a couple of gentlemen out back in July. <clears throat> and uh, the, 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 you know, the other guys in our group, we're there thinking that, well, one brother was going to be the one that's going to be like, he was going to jump up and down and think it's the greatest thing, and the other one's going to be timid. Well, it flip-flopped. <laughs> the one we thought was going to be timid was the one just thought it was the coolest thing in the world and what he just saw, and it was the old, and it was the older with the older brother that actually just got all freaked out about it and just didn't want no more to do with it because you never know what's in a person's mind, and that's why we try to explain to people when they want to try to go out and, well, I want to go see a Bigfoot, we explain that, well, 
just be careful what you ask for because sometimes people do get a little bit more than what they bargained for because there are tons and tons of witnesses that I've interviewed and they're on reports that they were in the woods. They weren't expecting to have a Bigfoot. They, Bigfoot wasn't even near, near their mind. They were out doing whatever they were doing, hunting, scouting, uh, getting their deer stand, hiking or whatever. They have a face-to-face and then it just runs or, you know, it's a traumatic experience and they just don't want to go in the woods no more. So that's why we like to explain to people that sometimes it's not all roses. <laughs> some when, things happen and some people have problems with it. When you witness a Bigfoot, I mean, is it abundantly clear that that is a Bigfoot when you see it? Um, let me try to set the, set the tone. Have you ever been separated from a family member or a dear friend and the first time you see them after all these years, what happens? What, what, what comes to you? Your, you know, what, 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 what's your emotions? Um, you know, it's very heavy on the heart. It's, you know, you're, oh, yeah. you're teary eyed and you can't see that, that right there is what I get every time I see one. Wow. Because it, because again, you are looking at something that everybody in the world says, ah, it don't exist. It's just a myth. Well, I'm looking right at it. <laughs> but there's also another thing that goes with it, too, is they don't move like we do. They don't walk like we do. They're very swift. They're very fluid. They're very, they're, you know, if somebody were trying to hoax me, get in a suit and be at least 9 or 10 feet tall and try to maneuver through the woods at night in pitch black with the ability of no night vision, I would say they were probably the best scam artist there is because some of the terrain that, you know, that we're in, whatever's walking up there and moving as fast as it is, I mean, it, you know, <laughs> what else could it be? Upright, large, speaks with a different type of, you know, they, they speak with their, you know, they have their own language and their fluidness and speed at which they move through the woods at night that, you know. Um, I have a question from a listener. Um, that wanted to ask you something. Um, this listener wants to know, do you believe that the Yeti from the Himalayan mountains is of the same species as the one as the North American Sasquatch? Uh, according to the DNA, um, cause I'm also part of a DNA project. It's been in existence for all oh, a little over getting ready to go on 10 years. Um, the Yeti would be the cousin to our North America Bigfoot. The Bigfoots, there are different, you know, there, if you were to say, like that question is, the classification of all Bigfoots being the same, they're not. They're, they have their relatives just like we have our relatives. You know, the Yeti, um, the Japanese call them the Higabon. They're much shorter. You know, the Chinese have a name for them. Asia obviously has a name for them. Australia, but to answer that question, and from what I understand, according to the DNA, the Yeti would be just a, it would be a cousin of the North American Bigfoot because there are some things that they, that uh, what they were describing in Nepal and Himalayas of how the Bigfoot or how the, the Sasquatch Yeti act there sometimes are much more different than how ours are reported to behave in North America. So basically, like a dog has several different kind of breeds, is that how it works with that Bigfoot? Would, that would be... Yeah, that would be a that would be a better explanation. Yeah, that's, a, that's a much better explanation um, because of behavior. Because you, I'm sure you've heard where people refer to the the bigfoots in the South, you know, Mississippi, Louisiana, and they're they're more aggressive than they are in the ones in the North, you know. So, and they, even with the DNA of the swamp ape, you know, it's very clear that they're completely separate, genet- they're genetically different than the bigfoots in Oklahoma and Colorado and the and the you know, in the PNW or the, you know, the Pacific Northwest. So they're just, you're, you're, I mean, that's exactly a good way to describe it. There's different breeds. Um, are they known to be like aggressive and mean or are they, do they have a gentle nature? Well, honestly, in my personal experience, they have a very gentle, the very, very gentle nature, but maybe my behavior and my actions towards them that's what I get in return because I can tell you tons and tons of stories where they are being mean to people because first off, it's the human being mean towards them. 
you treat them how they usually like to be treated. I mean, there, there, there is something to learn. And people say, well, you're getting too into this, and you maybe you're kind of worshiping the Bigfoot too much. No, that's not it. You put what you put in, and what you put, you know, you get out of it. And what some things that they're they're teaching you by default is respect, to be patient, and to you know treat everybody the same because there are tons and tons of stories of them smashing campsites and you know harassing people at their home, you know log cabins out in the middle of nowhere and uh, just tearing you know uh, property up. Well, it's because the humans are actually doing something that's causing that type of behavior. So. In my opinion, you know, there are the ones, and, and they're just like we are. They have bad apples in their group just like we are. I'm pretty sure if you were to <laughs> if you were to have a conversation, some of them probably don't want nothing to do with humans because of the way we behave. And I would say that's probably another reason why a lot of them have nothing to do with, with you know, with, with us because of our behavior and the way we treat each other. I guess I can't blame them there. Sometimes I have a problem with people just the way people <laughs> treat each other. <laughs> Right, right. Do we know where they stem from, where these Yetis and Bigfoot came from? I mean, how long, well, they, a, how long they've been around and, and where they came from? Well, that's a very controversial uh, question. The answer, actually, the, no, 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 I take that better phrase. Your question is valid. It's the answer that's very controversial. You know, the DNA says one thing, and that's why a lot of people are having a hard time believing, because not only... Uh, does Dr. Ketchum's uh, findings in her DNA support what I'm about to say, but there's other parallel projects that have now come up to the same type of findings she has. So everybody's now starting to realize, well, maybe her stuff was real. Maybe her stuff is because they're getting the same thing she is. You, and this is where a lot of people are having problems. Imagine the situation where you have not seen a big foot, but you go out and you have a sighting of something that your toe does not exist the fluidness of their movement, their ability to be there one second and over there on a the clear on the other side of the field or another, and just their appearance in your eyes, because, you know, our eyes see something, but our brain tries to tell you you saw something else. Our brain is our worst enemy. Well, according to the DNA, as well as just other projects that's had similar findings, you're looking at something that's really not supposed to exist. The DNA suggests that they're angelic that they are, their DNA, you know, DNA is very sophisticated. They, you know, someone could take a, your hair follicle and, and do a DNA and tell you what your parents, you know, uh, medical problems are. It's just so sophisticated. And you're looking at something that defies science. Wow. And everybody has a problem. You're, you, have, you have something that everybody has a problem with because the DNA is suggesting that the female mitochondrial DNA has humanistic traits within the DNA. It's not saying that they're human. It's just that somewhere down in their bloodline, human DNA has been introduced to that. So that's what people are getting confused about, and they're automatically jumping to the conclusion to say, oh, 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 Dr. Ketchum is immediately saying that you're human. No. Somewhere in their history, DNA, human DNA has been in, in introduced. That's the female mitochondrial DNA, but that's you know the male DNA is completely different. It's just it's 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 something that's not even of this world. So that's pretty awesome. I've never heard that before. I think that's <laughs> never heard that. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Well, I mean, it, it, it's very controversial with people, and there's a lot of people for the for years it's, it's been throwing rocks at that glass house that, that they're just not buying it, and they're saying it's all crazy. But and 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 here and think about it for just a second. If you have something that's supposed not supposed to exist, but yet people all over the world have been seeing something six or fashion of them, and now you have the DNA that suggests that they're angelic, that it actually puts a question mark to biblical implications of what they might be and where they're from, you're going to start throwing a wrench into the mix of people that are going to really have a bad time with that. So, you know, I mean, you can imagine how that's going to... I can, I, can re, I can relate to this because I'm into the paranormal and you know how many people think you're crazy because they honestly do not think that this stuff exists. They don't think that spirits are amongst us and ghosts exist and all that. I know exactly what you mean. 
Well, and, and actually, to tell you the truth, this is another category related to our human side of things because I, I'm, I'm, my, my attention and most of my experience is dealt strictly with the Bigfoot, but I also have an area of my life that sometimes I deal with weird, as we call it, weird things, and it's usually the spirit world, and my spirit world knowledge comes from my Native American background, but the problem is, is people are just so stuck in technology. They're stuck in, well, i got to go to a birthday tomorrow. I have a wedding next weekend. I've got this business. i got to get this done by five o'clock. I'm too wrapped up in their world, their own little world, not looking with an open mind and open eye to the actual world that they live in. Absolutely. That's, that's, the, that's just, I mean, and Bigfoot fits in the exact same category. So I absolutely yeah. agree with you. People, you know, if you say, like I've, there's so much paranormal that I've experienced. I'm 44 years old and experienced my whole life, you know, a lot of the paranormal things that other people don't experience and they kind of think you're crazy or, you know, well, because they haven't experienced they, it themselves, they don't really want to believe right. it. Exactly, exactly. And think about this. With my experience in, and I'll, and I'll just say it as a broad term, the spirit world, because it covers, you know, cover everything. Basically, we are a little tiny dot on a needle's head in this universe, and the spirit world is all around us. Basically, we are a piece of a glimpse of a sand in the ocean compared to the spirit world. We're just a little tiny piece, and people don't understand that the spirit world is all around us and operates in and around us every single day. That just people just are too busy going on about their day, and they just have better things to think about. So if they hear a story, their mind is wrapped up in their work, their family, their cars, their hobbies, but they don't understand that some people experience their spirit world as far as spirit, you know, spirits, ghosts, apparitions, and the weirdness of what our world, you know, has to offer. But, uh, you know, the Bigfoot is almost the exact same thing. The, the parallel to the Native American aspect of it is, you know, Bigfoot is a spiritual being. So, uh, the uh, uh, psychological um, op- uh, comprehension, or whatever word I'm trying to find, the uh, of knowledge about the Bigfoot in the same it's the same demeanor with people of not believing it because you know they see it on TV and that's the end of it. Yep, and you know you talk to a lot of people I have these days, and a lot of people, you know, because there's not a lot, uh, you know, the UFO stuff is kind of the biggest thing going on right now um and you don't so many people just disregard bigfoot like you know it's not as big as paranormal or ufology so they don't think it exists but i have such an open mind and i just love this stuff and i love to learn about it and i love to you know talk to people who've experienced this stuff because i think it's great and i have no doubt i believe wholeheartedly well you know, if you look at Native tradition, most tribes will tell you that they were here before them. What that means is basically a lot of oral tradition of the tribes within North America, their oral traditions about the tall man, the hairy man, the wild man is that they were in, the, you know, if, if they were coming, say they're coming from um, wherever they come from, say like, for instance, they say they, they come, they like the Choctaw, they, in their stories, they came out of the ground. That's that's their their myth of how they evolved into being a people, but in their legends and beliefs, like other tribes, the tall and hairy man was already here. They were already there. So, if so, you look at some traditions, similar as other tribes in other countries around the world, some of their stories are almost identical. So, are the we tall to, hairy man was already there? So, are we to believe that possibly the Bigfoot is something that was biblical to start with? Yes, and I mean, I, 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 I and you know, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I think. Due to all these years as an experience, you know, all this as an experience investigator, everything I've seen, add the DNA, my own biblical research, talking to different collegiate uh, uh, Christian, um, you know, teachers of the Bible. Basically, you're, what you're looking at is something, and, and it can be backed up by Scripture. 
you're looking at something that's post flood because obviously they can't be pre flood because everything was taken off, you know, everything was wiped out in the in the flood with Noah. Right. But there are scriptures that do substantiate that there was a second fall of angels post flood. And I know a lot of people have a controversy. And if you've never read it, you probably need to get you know go and and, and find a copy of it because there's various uh, ways. But if you hadn't to read the book of Enoch. It explains some gaps where the people that experienced the spirit world and involved in you know, Bigfoot or any other type of mystical creature, the Book of Enoch actually substantiates certain things, and a lot of people argue about the Book of Enoch being not being in the Bible for a certain reason. But there are biblical um, scriptures that does explain the certain types of events where the DNA of the Bigfoot actually support each other. So, but if you think about it, how many years have we been going with knowing the Bible is one way, and now you're going to throw a wrench into it saying, well, the Bigfoot is actually part of the fallen. What you're, the thing that the problem is, is what people don't understand is, it's not the Bigfoots that walk in the earth today. It's their ancestors, which would be the fallen. Because the DNA supports that they're generational. They have children. So they go a generation and they have other children. So you would have to look at it just like how we look at our history. It's not the Bigfoot that walked the earth now. It's the Bigfoot's ancestors that were that at that time. That's a different way of looking at it that I never quite thought of. Well, it's <laughs> uh, we've, we've had a lot of discussions with this. Uh, Dr. Ketchum, myself, and various other people, even some of the, uh, the you know, pastors and a few other people that do not quite believe in Bigfoot, but yet they do live in areas where Bigfoot is a common, common um, a household, you know, uh, conversation. And there is, and because I've, I've tried to review, and I've gone to their expertise to find out in Scripture as well, is there is support by Second Paul. And sure enough, there are certain Scriptures in various, you know, like you the King James and a few others that does support a second fall of angels. Right. And if your DNA says that they're angelic, that they're not of this world, and you can't not talk about Bigfoot and not get into discussion where there's some weirdness with Bigfoot that goes on and the strange supernatural aspects of it. So if you take their supernatural abilities in some ways, the things that they're able to do their DNA, add the other stuff to it, then, I mean, you only have one or two rows to go down of who or what they are. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that's what I love about this, you know, being able to plug different things in and all the possibilities, and that is actually a very cool concept. It is, but, it, but again, that, that throws a lot of stuff towards people that they're uncomfortable with. Because the biggest thing is they like the world the way it is. They don't want nothing to disrupt the world the way they think it is. And the world's not. It's, uh, you know, the, there's other mystical creatures out there that people have signs of. Uh, what they call it? Crypto, crypto, cryptozoology. Well, there's some things that run around that people think are Bigfoot that it's not a Bigfoot. Because its DNA, it doesn't match the other DNA. So you have other creatures that fit other topics and other classifications because the only thing else you have to put is that they you know they're they're not of this world so you get into the paranormal supernatural um what is it the cryptozoology that's a that's that's a that's a broad range of different things but my expertise is strictly you know the bigfoot as far as what i've seen and what i think they are according to the science aspect of it that is, to me, that's awesome. I mean, it just opens up a whole new realm of things. I think there's so many people out there, though, who are going to be uncomfortable with a lot of different concepts of others' beliefs and stuff. You know, I lost my dad exactly one year to the date tomorrow, and my father yeah. is never far from here. And the things that I experience that I know my dad is still here are things that a lot of people, you know, would never believe in a million years because they haven't experienced those things 
You know. Well, he's looking down. He's he's looking down on you with approval. He he is proud of what you've done with your life. And see, the the thing with it is, is people don't understand the connection. Uh, I know you, you know everybody has. Some people don't believe the Bible. Some people do believe the Bible. Some people are just stuck in it. That's that's all they know. But there's so much gray area to our lives and to what really is beyond our comprehension. Our worst enemy, the worst thing we have going right now is our brains. That's the that's that's what kills everyone's beliefs, especially how they're raised and what our education was. And the worst off is TV. Imagine our world if we did not have TV computers or newspapers we just lived our lives that way now are there specific areas where the Bigfoot are more likely to be seen than others uh, well that's a good question it, they can be anywhere they want as long as they have security cover you know cover you know cover concealment water and food they can be anywhere but there are locations that they are much. The populations are much more. You have a much greater chance of having an experience because I think what it is is they live in their family groups and they tend to be more responsible for securing each other and being more protective of each other. So you may go into an area where you've heard a Bigfoot and never have an experience for a whole year, and then go across the street over in another stack of woods, and then you have activity all year long. So. It's it's one of those by chance type deals. As long as if you do your homework, uh, you know it's it, it's kind of a fifty fifty if if they're going to be there. I live in New York, and it's not often. I don't even think I have ever even heard of anybody experiencing a Bigfoot sighting here. Upstate New York, actually, Vermont. If you go in 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 when I was an investigator with BFRO. They had an internal database called the FLATS. It was password protected. That's where the investigators go in and get the reports. When you know when you submit a report, it goes into the FLATS. They get the, re- the report. When I left in 2010, there were a little over 37,000 reports in the database. Wow. And, of course, I only – now, remember, that was 2010. So you can probably do some multiplication by then. <laughs> when I left – I was strictly mainly doing Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. But, you know, I'm curious. I played around, and there were a great number of reports out of upstate New York, Vermont. Uh, I mean, numbers that you wouldn't even imagine, uh, Pennsylvania and a few others. You know, as long as you have an acreage of area, you know, I think you, y'all have some wildlife management areas upstate, too, and some national forest areas. You know, as long as it's a couple hundred acres or a couple thousand acres, they can be anywhere they want. Huh. What attracts them to, I mean, are they, I'm kind of curious, and we pro- probably none of us know, but, I mean, what do they do? I mean, what are their, how do they live? What do they eat? Well, that's kind of, that's kind of some of my thinking, too, and that's kind of, over the years, you know, I, I've racked my brain, and we've done every little thing we can. And, and I think what it is, the best thing I've learned to do is just learn it as I go. If I learn it, I learn it. If not, but one of the things that I've learned through the years talking to tribal elders and my own personal observation is, is their, for whatever reason, their existence is reproducing their own and living outside of us, the the manners in which the Native American look at it is they're non-materialistic. You know, they don't have uh, the same problems we have in our lives. Their whole existence, similar to ours, is to survive. Um, well, we have are, we have homes and, you know, we know what we eat. Like, you know, we sit down and eat and stuff. It just makes me wonder... I mean, what kind, what do they live in and as shelters and, I mean, do they eat different animals or are they vegetarians? That's all the stuff that interests me, so it makes me curious. uh, Most of my observation is, and most of my knowledge is, they're opportunistic hunters. Um, But according to the DNA, their metabolism is a little bit slower, so they don't require as much food as you'd think, and that's 
where when I watch these shows, these documentaries where certain Bigfoot experts um, say that there's not enough food here to sustain such a large animal. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not quite that way. They can go wherever they want. They're, you and I walk five miles. Their five miles is all, probably a 15 or 20 mile trek for years. Is, ours is five. So, you know, they have a much broader range of, of, of movement in an area. Their metabolism is much slower, which means that they don't require as much food, which also means that they're able to sustain the body heat by that slow metabolism in keeping a body, you know, where people always think, well, how can they be out there in the cold, frigid with bare feet? And, well, they're tough skin, almost like shoe leather. They're slow metabolism, so they're able to sustain that type of survival of those environments. There is well known by all most investigators that usually they're deer they're deer hunters. That's their main staple of course is deer. People have seen them eating nuts off trees, uh, leaves even off trees, grass, um, wild onions and fish. And I've seen places where we've had an abundance of uh, freshwater mussels out of a pond and out of a creek area that there's no way a, a raccoon you'd have to have a platoon of raccoons to eat as many <laughs> shell uh, mussels that we found in a couple locations. So the only other animal that would be large enough to eat that many in one sitting would be something similar to a, a Bigfoot. I always wondered that. You know, I figured because they travel so much, you know, and they're they're on the go like that, I figured that they were more, you know, whatever they could find in nature as well. Well, and I've worked a lot of investigations where people – We'll start out saying that, well, I don't think I have a Bigfoot problem, but what's funny is, is I find my gates open and our horse is led over to another part of the uh, the corral and, the, and their, their um, bridle is, you know, taken off and put up on a shelf and cat food is, you know, I'm, I'm missing almost a half a pound of cat food and, well, how do you have your cat food container? Well, it's a locked trash can lid with a big rock on top of it. Well... How do you find the trash can? Well, it's usually with the lid back locked and the rock back on top of it, but there's, you know, half a pound of food missing. That would ex- I mean, it- <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. what, <laughs> what kind of an animal is going to do that? <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and, of course, there's reports all over with different kinds, you know, them stealing chickens and taking, you know, pigs from farms and stuff and, you know, raiding crops. There's, you know, they're real big on watermelons and, and cantaloupes and stuff. So there's, you know, there's little reports like that coming in. Like I said, they're opportunistic. So, so they basically eat what they can to survive. Yes, that's what I kind of figured on that note. I'm just, you know, do you think that they build their own shelters, like out of whatever they can find, sticks and such, or do you think that they just sleep outside? Well. Actually, I have a, an experience with that. That actually, we had a location in Central Oklahoma, well, South Central Oklahoma. A, par, a friend of the a friend of the family's property that I've been going to for years, and I really didn't think anything about it until I started seeing stick structures and weird the way trees were bent over. So, one weekend, we decided we were going to hang out. Well, we were down in a creek bed, uh, traveling. And we were coming out of a creek bed. Now, this is just before dusk. And we were coming out of a tr- creek bed. And we were trying to be quiet, but just where we were walking, because the way the, the ground foliage and everything was, we were able to maintain a little bit of stealthness. Well, as we came up out of the creek bed up onto the bank, we heard this huge noise. We looked over to our left, and we kind of tell of just one of them running as it was bailing over a fence, a barbed wire fence, and down in, into another gully. Well... We were wondering how come we couldn't see at one point what, what it had done was it had built a little wall. It had taken some trees that had already fallen and died and created a w- little barrier. And if you looked at it, it would be the same thing as how a human would build a blind if they were turkey hunting or deer hunting. And if you were to walk by, you would never even, you just thought it was the top of the tree had fell and created a brush pile. Well, they were intricately woven branches. And they made a little wall. And I guess it was laying down, bedded down there, resting. And we had come up there and just startled it. It took off running. Since then, we have found numerous of those types of uh, little structures built. So You know, that's funny. I have a property that belongs in my family. And uh, it's miles of just wooded area, mostly. And 
we walk through there a lot in the summer. And it's funny because the kind of structures that you're describing are the kind of structures that we found throughout that the whole thing. And, you know, we're like, wow, is this paranormal? Is this crazy? Because it just doesn't look nature made. Well, imagine imagine you are a, a Bigfoot. And instead of how you and I would figure we would travel, you know, a couple blocks, they travel many, many miles. Would say that your farm is 10 miles from our farm. Well, the farms in between... Let's say each farm has probably 50, 60, 80, or 100 acres. They would probably stay to the very back part of that, but they would probably build their little structures. So if they're traveling from point A to point B and they decide they're going to bed down, at least they have one they can go over and find. And what's kind of funny, that was something I learned in the military during a particular type of school that basically teaches you how to survive in enemy territory, and basically what it is is you're traveling to be a, to avoid being detected, and you build these little shelters that you can stay in while you're traveling. So I think either they learn that method or they use that method. The Native Americans learn that method or had that method, and then usually the military picked up on it because uh, it's kind of interesting the same way that I was taught to survive to build shelters and to find food is exactly almost identical to some of these stories of how the Bigfoot survive. So I just find it kind of fascinating. Do you believe that they're more, their intelligence is of more of animal or man? I would say both. If I took you and put you out in the wilderness and just left you for a year, you would become almost animal-like in behavior, because you have to um, take on that uh, persona, you have to take on that, that attitude, that mental uh, toughness, that mental survival to be able to survive in the wild. So you take something that is born and raised in the woods, it is taught to survive, to stay away from man, to hunt its food, but at the same time there's something about it that has a much more intellectual, more keen sense of intelligence than we can probably ever imagine because remember they're not tainted with our drama and our everyday uh, psychological problems so I would say that they're probably much more and, and I like to think because what I've seen and also in Native tradition that they know what's in your heart they know who they want to be seen by and who they want to have contact with and I think that's why sometimes some people get to have all the experience some people don't because the way the person, the human being, is behaving and what is probably their underlying um, intention. I think they're, the Bigfoots are just smart enough to know what other per, you know, what their intentions are. And that's, that's something I learned a long time ago because I was told the first thing, the reason why the Bigfoot come around certain people is because they know, they know who you are. They know what's in your heart. So they basically have somewhat of the senses that we do. And that I mean, some of us can... Like I, for instance, can kind of tell if somebody is pure of heart or what, and you know what they are in their well, heart. Well, let me let me th- let me throw this at you. For five years, I was doing reports, and I started realizing, well, wait a minute, it's not the Bigfoot doing stuff. Let's look at the people. What are the people doing that's causing the Bigfoot to come to their location, their houses? Well, I started finding a little bit of a of a strange. Um, comparison with all the reports, I can just call it the witnessology, the study of the witness. Well, I come starting to find out it was children in these certain families that were having the experiences and the sightings that were telling the family, and then the family was just, you know, oh, they're seeing something. And then, then finally, the family would start to see it. But here's the deal. Most of those children were either autistic or had Down syndrome. Huh. So what, what was the attraction? That's interesting. So it, it was. And it was not just like one or two families. I mean, it was like almost, a, it was a dozen families that were, that, and then when I started realizing the particular children in the family, like one family had three kids and only one had Down syndrome, and it was that child that had the experiences most of the time. So what does that say to the mindset if you were to try to figure out why is the Bigfoot only attracted to that particular child? What if they had the same level of um, cognitive you know, brain uh, capacity or function, whatever I'm trying to say, is what if they're just a clairvoyant? 
Well, I think that um, people with Down syndrome and such, um, I think that they have, they're a lot more intelligent than what we give them credit for. You know, we think that they're, you know, slower or whatever, but I don't believe right. that at all. I think that they're right. much more intelligent than possibly we are. And 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 what's the possibility that, 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 that the Bigfoot can pick that up? Because one of the children that I finally got, I got, I finally got able to break break through to him and actually sit talk with him for a while and discuss it in depth was he was autistic. He's he and his mom actually confirmed because his mom was the one that actually had made the comment about it when it first started. About a year into it, there would be times he would sit at the at the window, the kitchen window, and look out the, and just stare. They would just stare at each other. They'd literally just stare at each other. And but the Bigfoot was in a situation where it wasn't exposing his whole, you know, his whole body. He was only you could only see his head, and sometimes you could only see his face through the foliage. But they would sit there and stare at each other for hours. So you know, <laughs> I I don't have no answer to it, but I just found it interesting that for a period of time I was finding more experiences with uh, uh, the children that were you know that. that uh, Again, that was either Down syndrome or autistic. So basically, they can sense when they're safe or when someone doesn't mean them any harm. Uh, yes, I, I truly believe that. If someone were to hunt them or to kill them, would that be considered murder, or would that be considered just hunting game as you would an animal in the woods? Well, that probably brings up another hour of discussion because you're bringing the government into it. The government in my opinion, knows very well what they are. They know very well the situation because all the shootings that I know of, all the shootings that I've looked into that I know someone else investigated, all the shootings that I've ever heard of, they all pretty much end up the same way. Somebody came in and, or somebody came in and, and um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to find? They, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, they came in and, and not, not contraband, what's the word? They come in and, and confiscated. They come in and confiscated the body and told the person, collected all their, their computers or their guns and just told them, you know, this never happened. So if somebody were to shoe on, like this TV show uh, uh, on Destination America, this, this Killing Bigfoot show, if they were to shoe one, maintain complete secrecy. No one knows about it. They get a lab involved. And they come out on the air with it on the episode. You can pretty much guarantee. I will bet my paycheck that they will have a knock on the door the next day. For some reason, the government just does not want us. They just they don't want the proof out there because there are time after time after time of these little shootings, these little incidents that come up that I hear about. That it gets to one point, and then there's no more information about it because somebody else came in and took possession of the body, and they were told that you know that it never happened. I think I get frustrated with these shows that, you know, finding Bigfoot and killing Bigfoot and all this stuff, and they're out there and they're looking and looking, and it just seems so ridiculous. They're not finding anything, and how they're going about looking for these Bigfoot is sometimes absolutely silly. Well, the, the it's all about the show. I've been involved, I have been personally involved in a couple TV shows that started to go somewhere and then they didn't because... That, that, that basically Hollywood wants Hollywood. Finding Bigfoot is not going to find Bigfoot because then the show, you know, what's the, where's the show else going to go? So it's a pursuit. That's what people are. That's what people are all into it about. People get magnetized and hypnotized about the pursuit. And I'm understanding. I think uh, Matt and them just got a new season. I think they have a new season coming on. I mean, <laughs> it's all Hollywood. I think there's there. If you look for one show about home cooking, there's going to be about five shows about Bigfoot. They're just coming out everywhere. Um, there's really, I just would like to see a show that really tells the truth, that really tells how it really is. <laughs> and the thing with it is, is a couple of the shows I've been involved in, in the beginning, it was it started to go with Hollywood, and we explained, look, you want the real world? Let's do the real world. Let's, let's, let's say this is how it really works. Well, 
in some in some fashions it wasn't glamorous glamour glamorous I know, I can't speak. <laughs> it wasn't glamour it didn't have glamour. They wanted Hollywood, they wanted it to be scary, they wanted to well, in our world, how we do it down here, they're not scary. But you know I agree with you. I'd love to see a show that's real. Something that has some sort of you know Well if we if and my idea of a show would be is take it from the history. There are three or four different DNA projects that's parallel in Dr. Ketchum's, and they are starting to come with the exact same findings she is. So obviously she is correct. If you take the history, Native American history, take history from all over the world, and then start adding the DNA into it and then start pursuing that aspect of what are they, what are they not, you, you know, you don't have to come to a conclusion, but show the different, show the different types of uh, you know, between the Yeti and the North American, what's the behavior with the ones in the South and behavior with the North, ones in the North? You know, take the people that have had bad, negative, show their side. They take the people that have positive, you know, just, just show the truth. Absolutely. That, you know, these shows these days, some of them really frustrate me. I mean, I love the paranormal shows, too. But sometimes you can absolutely tell on some of these paranormal shows what is absolutely just not going on. And, right, you know, right. I want to show that instead of, you know, the camera never picks up what they see. And they'll say, oh, did right. you see that? And they'll pan over and you totally missed whatever it is they said they saw, which does not tell me whether they really saw it or not. It tells me pretty much that they didn't see it. Otherwise, we would have. And it just, you know, those are the things that frustrate me. If you're going to see something in paranormal, we want to see it too. You know, if you're hunting right, Bigfoot, right. we want to. If if you find, we want you to find Bigfoot. We don't just want you to run around the woods. Right, right. Well, hopefully exactly. someday somebody will actually do that. You know. For, well, I it's you know it, you know there we 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 basically back in 2010. We had a show getting ready to go. We did the promo, the, the teaser. Well, we took a couple of the producer, one of the producers, and took them down and said, look, here's, here's what you hear on the TV. Here's what you're seeing. But let's take you out in the field and show you the real world. That's right. That's so we where it should the, be. They, we, well, we took them out in the field, and they got to see something that basically upset them. They saw something that was just it did not fit in their little, their little nice little Hollywood box. And then they're basically, their question, their comment basically was, was well, how do we show the world this? I said, we don't. We, we show the people the truth. He goes, man, I can't go back to the to the, to the to the to these people and tell them that I saw something do this and saw something do that. I'm like, well, this is the real world. You want the real world about Bigfoot? Here it is. And he got to see it, and it, and it just it freaked him out so bad. You know, I, I'm a big movie person, and I'm still waiting for you know them to... There's a movie on the Nephilim that's supposed to be coming out, and it keeps getting delayed and delayed, and there's all these UFO movies that are coming out, and I've yet to see anything that has any kind of truth to it. And it's so frustrating right. to me because I am just a movie freak. I look, you know, every night before bed, I'm we're constantly looking for movies to watch, and there's absolutely nothing out there that's of any interest. Right. And that's my big thing is I'm that's what I'm looking for. So, well, you know the, the 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 Christian world is getting attacked. You know, you believe in God, you're getting attacked, and 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 there's very little things out there to explain what's really going on. And everybody wants to have have their own, you know, and and everybody's into this um uh this uh this uh I forgot what it's called now the different. Uh, uh, voodoo or not voodoo, but different type of black magic or a different type of goth, uh, not goth, but demon worship or there's another word I'm trying to find, but you throw into that and you, you find very little stuff about the real truth about our existence and everything, but again, like I said, if you bring supposedly what the DNA says about what Bigfoot are, then you're just you're just challenging everybody that you know, the next one is 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 real but we're not saying that the Bigfoot are angels. We're just saying that their DNA suggests that their ancestors were that. So, you know, some people don't want to hear it. <laughs> I know. And, and that's, you know, everybody has their own opinions and their own beliefs in this world. But, you know, for me, I think that if people open their minds a little bit, there's so much more to this world than what we think. Right, right. It's, 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 
the the magnitude of the comp the, the the comprehension of trying to figure out the entire world just it, it, it gives you it gives me a headache. There just there's no there's no way to comprehend it. In my personal opinion, I don't think we're alone in where we are living or where we're walking. Um, I, for me, my personal belief in the, in things is, you know, I share space with another dimension of whatever it is, whether it's human or creature or alien or whatever. I believe that I share space right where I'm sitting right now with something I can't see. And, right, you know, right. who's, who's to say whether I'm right or not? But, I mean, I have witnessed so much of the spirit world. I mean, things happen around me that are just not, you, you cannot explain them. They're, they're absolutely paranormal. But well, you, you, the shadow people, that, I think that's what put me on to that belief, is the shadow people. I think that the shadow people are just other beings that live in a different you know, a parallel or a different dimension from us that accidentally get seen, even though they're, we're not supposed to see them. Right, right. And and, thing, and and see, science can prove that there's energy all around. Science can tell you that there's energy all around you 24 hours everywhere you go. But spirits have energy. So the the shadow people, when... I started having my little experiences on my personal side about about my you know what, what, what I guess people refer to it as your spiritual awakening. I was seeing dark figures, but what I learned in the beginning was that both native culture, Christian culture, Christian beliefs, the shadow people are not good. And I was always told by a couple of tribal elders that do not follow the tribal or I'm sorry, do not follow the shadow people, do not chase after them. They are not good. They are not of God. Or they are of God. They're created in that sense of the spirit world, but they are not of God. So since I have opened my mind much more to God's Word and to put myself in Scripture more, I see the shadow people less. I see them every now and then, not like I used to, but every now and then. So, you know, I guess... So basically, (laughs) your belief is that they're kind of... of more of, of the Satan side of it or Lucifer side of it than well, they are God? Y- yes, yes, and here and here's here's the reason why. There are many stories of people encountering these uh, children that are wearing dark clothes and dark hoods, but when they look and turn towards them, they can't see a face. Well, the same as other um, uh, mystic-type uh, encounters with people they're wearing all dark clothes and hoods, and when they turn, you can't see their face. When I think it was probably about four years ago, I was seeing the, the, these these people, these shadowed, you know, these dark figures, just almost daily, every day. And one day, it got to the point that I started actually getting this anxiety feeling, and then I started associating the anxiety with seeing either having anxiety before I saw them or saw one out of the corner of my eye and then had the anxiety. But when I started to actually start utilizing prayer, that diminished. And then I had somebody else having the same situation, did not know, until one day I saw their behavior and asked them what's going on. They told me basically they were experiencing the same as me, same as I. When I got them into the point of not trying to convince them, but just try this, just just open your mind to this and just let try let this work. When he started utilizing scripture and stuff and prayer, it diminished. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know what else to describe it. And there can be different types of shadow people, but most of my experience is, is that they're 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 not good because even a tribal elder told me one time, even in native culture, the shadow people, the dark people, are that of the dark. They're not of the light. That's very and interesting. That, I, I've heard that before. And and I believe that. I mean, something that's that dark, that you know, that black right. shadow. I mean, right. would you'd kind of plug that in in your brain as dark, you know, or evil? Right, right. Well, it's kind of funny. If it's supposed to be good, then how come when you use scripture, it 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 goes away? Absolutely. <laughs> so, 
That is, there, I've learned so much from you just in this hour. <laughs> this was amazing. I mean, I was so excited about this interview because it was my first time, you know, like I said, being able to, to share an experience about Bigfoot. And this was amazing. I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on here with us. I have learned. Oh, no like I, Oh, this was absolutely amazing. And I would so love to have you back on to talk about more. Oh, yeah, anytime, because, like, again, you know, and, and maybe you could answer, maybe your listeners have an answer for me, because, you know, how can, you know, I've dealt with this for so long, and then it, it was in about 2009 when my mom passed away. Just my life turned, you know, my personal life, I, I'm not talking about Bigfoot, I'm just talking about my personal life just made a flip-flop. And my mind was opened up to this world that just, it, it, I thought I was going crazy. And then it was the help of my friends telling me, said, "No, no, no, you're 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 this way, you're that way." Some of it got kind of new age, and I'm not in the new age stuff. But you know, some people said, "Well, you know, you're you're empathic, or you're this, or you're that." I'm like, well, "I don't know nothing about that stuff, but <laughs> I have this going on." So I don't like the, you know, I don't really like the titles. But and what's the comparison with my life with that and going down that road and that journey and that in the spirit essence of it? But at the same time. I had this other stuff going on with Bigfoot. I'm not trying to make them, you know, I'm not trying to say they're connected, but I don't know what else, to, I mean, I don't know what else, how you else to describe it. Well, I think what you got going on is pretty cool. I mean, the stuff that you're able to experience, I mean, you're out there in the field and you're doing it and you're, you're actually witnessing this stuff. And I think it's just fabulous. Well, it, 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 it is. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. You know, God obviously has a, has a purpose for all of us, but, a lot of stuff that my friends and I experience, a lot of stuff, and I'll tell you, there's so much that we see in here that sometimes we just turn like each other and go, we ain't saying a word to nobody. <laughs> because we see things that just don't, they just don't make sense. You know, I've seen those things. Um, my boyfriend and I were standing looking out the window, and there was this little teeny tiny, and I mean, it was like way off in the distance, and it looked like a little star in the sky. And but it looked at the same time not like a star that we recognized. And you know, he said to me, What is that over there? And I said, I don't know, that's strange. And no more did we get that out of our mouths. It was like somebody lassoed this little teeny light, brought it up in front of us as a full fledged full moon in front of us. And it was within, I mean, not even a full second, it was full from this tiny little light to a full fledged full moon. And it was like somebody did it just to show us, hey, this is what that is in the, you know, in the horizon. And it was, it's stuff that you can tell people, but unless you've experienced something of that big, you know, big event, nobody believes you. Yeah, and 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 that's and and, and that's one of the things that when the, the this family that stayed over from the conference that stayed, but one of the things I would explain to them because we had an incident happen. The Sunday night that still gets me kind of wondering what in the world happened. But my my uh, comment to the, the the husband that was there, and he was a little bit of a skeptic. But I told him, I said, the thing with it is, is things happen any minute, any second. We could sit in a chair for four hours, and not one thing happened. You have to be paying attention at all times because you're going to miss it. Absolutely. Because there was a thing happened that started out as a normal situation. And one of the other guys, Farman, he can walk up and goes, hey, who's that over there with a flashlight? I said, nobody's with a flashlight. We're all sitting right here, and so-and-so's in the, in the RV. He goes, well, who's that? And then we got up, and then it just created a whole, uh, I don't know what to tell you. It was a paranormal incident. That's all we can tell you. <laughs> and that's the so, thing, though. This little things. Yeah. It, when you experience they them, they are real. They really happen. And you have to be paying attention, because like I told the, 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 the husband, I said, look, that started out as a normal incident. It started out thinking, well, who's that with a flashlight? It ended up being a full-blown, drawn-out, what in the world just happened. And that's what I was explaining to him, especially with the Bigfoot stuff. Yeah. When you're in the woods, you've got to be paying attention. The, the attention to detail is the key because you're going to miss them. And that's and you know that's one of the things that people just haven't, I guess, when they're out in the field, they just haven't accustomed themselves to. you really got to have your head, your head on a swivel. And you pay attention to everything. I think a lot of the problem with that is people's impatience. They're expecting something right now. That you know, like you said, yep. they want it on their time. Well, I call it the Burger King uh, syndrome. 
they're on, they're on the Burger King Bigfoot syndrome. That's right. They you have it your way. Now. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And I see nope. that. I it, see it, it with. It, the, I see it a lot. <laughs> well, but yeah, anytime you want me to to come back on and discuss any of that stuff, just just let me know. And I'll you know a lot of it I'm not too familiar with because you know, again, when I see something, I thought I knew something. And sometimes I realize I didn't know nothing because it, sometimes things just set you back when you realize you thought you knew what it was and it isn't. So, I think that's true with all of us. I mean, like I said, my dad shows up in his own weird ways. Um, I have a moon on my wall, and when you push the the remote on it, it turns on in quarters. Well, I was talking about my dad with one of my friends on the phone, and all of a sudden that moon lit up full force, and the remote was on the other side of the room. And I was the only one in the room, and my daughter was seven years old at the time, um, and now she's eight. But she came in the room just as it turned on, and she said, did you just turn that on? What just happened here? And I said, I didn't just turn that on, but you saw that. We both saw it. Come on. And she walked. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. You know, she went over, and she got the remote, and she shut it off, but... It was, and you had to shut it off in quarters too, and that was the weirdest wow. thing. Is it does not come on full fledged like that? Wow. Yep. It 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 happens. And like you said, if you're not paying attention, you will miss it. Exactly. That's exactly. why I think people need awareness in this world that there's so much more going on around us, and we are so impatient, or so we're not looking up. We're not looking around. We're not paying attention. And so many of us are missing what happens right in front of us. Well, most of everybody, in a sense, sometimes they just don't really care because they say, well, how does that benefit me? That's how I've had a lot of people tell me because I'll I'll say, well, man, why did that do that? And I'll have to try to figure out why did it do that or what was the actually. Then I've had people tell me, well, why do you care? What does it benefit you? I'm like, well, it benefits me a lot. (laughs) To know what's going on around us. That is awesome. Yes. Because but, we got to experience it firsthand. Right, right. That I think that separates us, you know, as the adventurous people who are out there looking for it to those who, as you said, ask you, what does it benefit you? Well, it benefits right. me because I got to witness it firsthand. This is awesome. Well, I, I've gotten to the point now that, you know, some of my friends, you know, they, they, they know, they just call me super sensitive. That's what they call me. But basically, it's a sense of this. I'm, I'm on the point that I'm like, well, how come the rest of the world can't see what I see? I think they're the ones that are weird, and I'm the one normal, because this world is completely different than what people think it is. I think a lot of people, I, I don't think, I think we all have the ability to see the same things, but I don't think our imaginations or our want to see the same things allow us to. Well, and that's true, because there is a lot of people sometimes that I know that are sensitive to the spirit world that are gifted in some ways, but I've had them, I've been with them and something happened and I go, oh uh, wow, and then it'll be like, what? I'm like, well, there's something not right in this room, there's something, I feel it and they're like, oh, I don't want to know, I don't know I just don't want nothing to do with it. That's right, like, well, I think fear, it's their fear, well, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of them well, fear it. I don't want and my explanation is I don't want it either but for whatever reason, I can't do nothing about it That's it's, right, <laughs> You know, I had to deal with it. It's happening. It. Right. So, you know, I'm either, either I, or I had accept it, deal with it, or I use scripture and make it go away. But the thing with it is, I've learned over this last, going on six years now, there's nothing I can do about it. When I go into a room, if I feel it, there's nothing I can do about it. I got to put prayer on it, do what I can do, you know, ask the Lord for whatever guidance and knowledge, wisdom he needs. Where he wants me to have, but I can't ignore some of these things. And some people go, well, I just turn it off. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't. I've tried. It That's work. right. There are some of us more sensitive to it than others, and I I believe that fully. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I would absolutely, absolutely love to have you back on because this is fascinating, and this is the stuff I absolutely live for. You know, to, well, to this was like one of the best interviews because, you know, I – it fascinates me, and to get this information out to to people, maybe they'll start opening their eyes and looking around. Well, and that's what happens. You know, when I bring people out on expeditions, sometimes I learn from them, not as much as they learn from me, because sometimes I learn from people, and and, and I've been, you know, it's, it's like teaching martial arts. I've been involved in martial arts. 
pretty much all my life. A good instructor is, can learn from his students as much as the student can learn from the instructor. And every time I'm out, I learn something new. Like I learned the other night, you got to be paying attention because stuff can be right there in front of you, and you ha- you just think it's you think it starts out as a normal everyday event, and then it turns into a really weird sci-fi movie that you're just pulling your hair out trying to figure out what in the world just happened. So, Absolutely. Um, can you give everybody but, your website, and do you have any books out? No, actually, to tell you the truth, I've been <laughs> I've been hounded day and night from people about writing a book, but you know, I, I don't know if I'm ready yet because I'm still learning so much, and there's so much going on. But I would I would venture that if I could get to a point where I could have somebody help me write a book, because first off. I went to school in Oklahoma, so, you know, my edu- English is not going to be very good. My grammar is going to be horrible. But the website, uh, let's see, it's a blog. Uh, is it's, I'm going to spell it out for you. It's H-O-N-O-B-I-A-O-K-L-A-C-H-I-T-O dot blogspot dot com. All righty. And that basically just spells out uh, Hona de Oklachito because that's the Choctaw word for big people. Well, you know, I advise our, my listeners to go on there and, and, you know, check out your blog. I think you're fascinating, and I look forward to to reading a book you write. I, I really hope that you do because the information you have is, is way too, you know, amazing not to. Well, I, I've actually started a journal in a sense of, but what's funny is every time I get to a point thing, okay, well, I'll make this one, then something else happens, and it just opens things up. So I, I'm kind of working with a couple of people that's kind of helped me trying to figure out how to go about it because, you know, I have my, which would have been a hobby in the days of the Bigfoot stuff, but my spiritual side has taken over my life to a point now that they both are almost intermingling uh, and it's almost the point that, man, I just don't know where to start, even where to start in a book. <laughs> but well, I guess you could start in the beginning, so. I think that makes it more interesting because your spiritual side is involved. I think it makes it a lot more interesting. Well, it is. It's an interesting life. I pretty much, you know, I could tell, uh, uh, I told somebody the other day, my life is basically a paranormal TV show. That's great, so. I think. <laughs> Well, it is, it, it, but it, it, it's, 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 um, of course, you know, and probably you've interviewed quite a few people. It's, it, you're, you're, you're dealing with, with a situation sometimes you just tell people because people are going to look at you funny and crazy. Oh, yes. So, um, you know, sometimes you got to live this by, you got to live this alone and try to figure it out on your own. There's no, there's no, uh, psychic, uh, paranormal book for dummies. So you just <laughs> got to rely on your friends and people that may have had the experiences before you. So, it's absolutely true, and and I know that just from personal experience. Before I even started doing this show, I mean, the things that you experience like this, there's so much. You're going to have you know skeptics out there who are just going to think you're need to be committed. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, well, yeah. Anytime, anytime. I'll I'll be happy to be on. That would be great because I'd love to have you on here again for another hour. I mean, there's so much more to talk about and so much to cover. This was great. Okay, no problem. Well, thank you so much, and you have a great night. All right, you too. Thank Talk you. To you later. Bye. Wow, guys, that was an absolute amazing interview. That was a lot of fun. Um, I learned a lot, a lot about Bigfoot that. I never even imagined. So, you know what? Get on his blog spot, you guys, and check it out because that was a lot of fun. And I look forward to, you know, if he does decide to write a book, that would be really a really interesting book. Well, that's all we have time for today. We post our shows on YouTube. And if you want to know more about our, our guests and upcoming shows, please feel free to visit our Info to Rail webpage. Just Google Info Number 2 Rail um, and click on our Google Sites page. And uh, I want to thank you guys, each and every one of you, um, from the guests to the listeners. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be able to do this, and I absolutely love what I do. Um, And I wanted to say a special thank you to um, the special man of my life, 
who helped me get started in this and backs me up and stands behind me through all this. You know, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I was. He helped me get started and he gave me the encouragement and the support to do this. And I just want to thank him very much. Um, we hope to see you here each and every week. Uh, we have a lot of fun with our guests, and um, I absolutely love to learn. So, you know, we have lots of upcoming guests. Just, you know, get on there and check them out because there's a lot of cool ones coming up. And for all you Marshall Master fans, he's coming back. So get on there and check that date out. May God bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon.